Welcome to this lecture in my series on the history of New Orleans. I'm Bruce Baker, and today's lecture is about New Orleans in the Civil War. So the main idea for today is that the Civil War brought major demographic changes to New Orleans and served as a complete rupture in its economic history although the city sustained little physical damage. So, as with any lecture on the Civil War, we could talk endlessly about things, but I'm going to try to focus on just a few key things. Uh, I'm not really going to talk much about the occupation. I'm not going to talk about Ben Butler, and there's lots of things I'm not going to talk about, but I will try to spend just a, a hopefully coherent, focused, sort of story around these key things. So if we take this main idea as our starting point, then I want to work from the end of that backwards. Why did New Orleans sustain relatively little damage, physical damage, in the war? And a lot of that has to do with the background and the way that the war played out in New Orleans. So the background, of course, is that Louisiana had seceded from the Union on January 22nd, 1861. It joins the Confederacy in March, and as we know, fighting breaks out in the Civil War when Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor is shelled on April 12th, 1861. Now, one of the first things that happens in the war, and you, we could say the most significant thing that happens for the city of New Orleans, is a naval blockade is put up. And let's start by thinking why a naval blockade is put in place. Well, that's because, broadly speaking, the South's economy was built around exporting raw materials and then importing the finished goods that it needed. And if the South can't export, especially cotton, of course, then that's going to basically cripple its economy. So the naval blockade blockading essentially all of the ports, um, it's you know, varying effectiveness uh, through, through the war, but it keeps the South, South from being able to sell the things that it produces, particularly cotton, and it also prevents it from buying the things that it needs from abroad. And this is particularly the case for war material, so arms and other sorts of supplies and so forth. So the Union is just going to sort of constrict um, this blockade around the South and sort of stop the, the sort of financial and, and sort of material progress that the Confederacy needed to keep going. So it's proclaimed on April 19th, 1861, and it has pretty profound significance on New Orleans, uh, particularly because, you know, New Orleans is a city that depends, as we've seen with Scott Marler's work, New Orleans is a city that depends on commerce. It's not manufacturing tons of stuff. It's bringing goods in and sending goods out and importing goods and distributing them and so forth. So if we think about the strategic significance of New Orleans, to the Confederacy within the Civil War. Even without most of its trade, New Orleans is still a large city. It's the largest city by a long shot in the South. And so it is a considerable source of arms and supplies of different kinds. It's also, of course, significant for access to the Mississippi River and eventually some of the tributaries off of the Mississippi River. When we think about the capture of New Orleans, um, it's very exciting and dramatic, but basically from about mid-January 1862, David Farragut, who was commanding the West Gulf Blockading Squadron, moved up the Mississippi River and towards the very end of April, fights his way past Fort Jackson and Fort St. Philip, um, about roughly halfway between New Orleans and the sea. Moves on up the river April 24th, 1862, and the city surrenders on April 25th, 1862. And the important thing here is that it surrenders without fighting, without bombardment, 
So in that sense, for that reason, the city doesn't really sustain the sort of damage that we see in places like Charleston or Richmond or Atlanta. So the second thing that I want to look at here is the question of demographic change. And we could say all sorts of things about the Union occupation and how white New Orleanians responded to that. But I think the more interesting story to be told here is the major demographic change that the fall of New Orleans so early in the war, really just a year into the Civil War, the major demographic change that that makes possible. And that's the story not about white Confederate New Orleanians and not about Mumford the Confederate who gets hanged because he tears the flag down off the U.S. Mint and all that stuff, but the story is really about African Americans in New Orleans. So if we look at the population of Orleans Parish at the outbreak of war in 1860 from the 1860 census, we see there are 149,063 white people, 10,939 free blacks, and 14,484 enslaved African Americans. Now, once New Orleans is in Union hands, over the next three years or so, uh, through the course of the rest of the war, there's a very large in-migration of African Americans from the countryside. So roughly somewhere in the vicinity of 30,000 African Americans come into the city from the countryside. And this obviously is because the city is controlled by the Union, it's uh, safety and opportunity and so forth, and it's a way to escape from increasingly uh, dire conditions on plantations um, where they're still enslaved. There are a lot of attempts to control this population through the use of the vagrancy laws. And this is, again, by the Union Army as much as by anybody else. And for more on that, see the work of John Bardis, uh, particularly the interview that's in this series, which goes into that in some detail. But this changes the makeup of the city, this in-migration during the war. And the short story of it is that New Orleans is less dominated demographically by white people after the Civil War. In 1860, the city is about 85% white and about 15% black. In 1870, that shifts by about 10%. So by 1870, New Orleans is more like 75% white and 25% black. One of the effects of Reconstruction that we also see, which sort of affects this, is that the position and, and the sort of social identity of enslaved people, or now previously enslaved or freed people, nudges closer to the position of free people of color. And maybe to put it in the opposite direction, the position of free people of color um, sort of moves towards the position of freed people. And we start to see a, a bit of rapprochement and a realization that, you know, free people of color who had perhaps been free for many generations, or several generations anyway, uh, in a lot of ways in this post-Civil War Reconstruction period, find that they actually do have uh, more in common with their recently enslaved uh, people than they had realized. And that's something that we also see in cities like Charleston um, to some extent after the Civil War. Now, the last thing to say about the Civil War and its effects on New Orleans is that it is really a complete rupture in its economic history. And this is for a number of different reasons. So the biggest reason of this is, of course, the end of slavery. That's the, the major political event of the 19th century, we could argue. Uh, it, but it's also a major restructuring of the economy of the whole nation, really, and of the South and of New Orleans particularly. And this is partly because enslaved people are no longer property. So it's, as we all sort of know, when we think about plantations and other forms of labor, it's no longer possible to extract labor without paying for it. Um, but just as importantly, and this is something that historians have focused on more and more in the past, say, 15 or 20 years, enslaved people as property had a very important fiscal function 
in the uh, Old South and in the Confederacy. That is to say, as a form of property, they could leverage borrowing. Um, they, they had a, a sort of value, not just for the labor that could be extracted from them, but for the, the monetary value within enslaved people. And they were a very liquid form of wealth. So if you have a, a plantation, if you have 500 acres somewhere in the middle of Louisiana, that 500 acres is just there. If you have the equivalent value in enslaved people, you can pick them up and sell them and so forth. So that makes it very attractive for people giving loans to back those loans, not with the land because they don't want a plantation in the middle of Louisiana that they would have to go and do something with or sell. What they want to back those loans, if you don't pay your loan back, is those enslaved laborers that they can then take to New Orleans and auction off and get their investment back. So suddenly, without the financial backing of enslaved laborers as collateral, the whole financial structure of the South uh, collapses in on itself in major ways. Uh, the value of enslaved people in themselves is not negligible. If we think about 14,800, sorry, 14,484 enslaved people in Orleans Parish, if we assume a, a very modest value of $500 apiece, that itself is $7.2 million, so not inconsiderable value there. Uh, another really important thing, and this is particular to New Orleans in a way that it's not particular to other places in the South, is the collapse of banking in the wake of the Civil War. And New Orleans, of course, had been the major banking center in the whole of the South in the antebellum period. Now, the New Orleans banks had been forced by the Confederacy to send their specie, that is to say their gold and silver coinage, that backed the banknotes that they had issued. The Confederacy, Confederate government, forced the banks to send that out of the city for safekeeping in September 1861 because they were concerned that if the Union captured uh, the city, then the Union would capture um, this specie and they would no longer be able to issue banknotes against it and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, what this means is that at the end of the war, these New Orleans banks have Confederate banknotes and Confederate bonds, which of course are useless but they also don't have the gold and silver in their vaults anymore because that's gone. So they really lose sort of everything and are more or less starting from scratch. Banking itself changes considerably during the Civil War. The National Banking Act and the Legal Tender Act had made it harder to create new banks, sort of set higher capital levels and change the way that they're gonna operate in terms of issuing banknotes. And all of these things together mean that banking doesn't really recover in New Orleans until around the beginning of the 20th century. A handful of things happen at the end of the 19th century, first couple years of the 20th century, and you start to see a major recovery of banking in New, New Orleans. But until then, from the Civil War until the beginning of the 20th century, the capacity for banking is much, much reduced in New Orleans, and this makes it everything much more difficult economically, I would say. Of course, the effects of closing the port for a couple of years and completely disrupting import and export business um, has an effect. And another thing that the Civil War does to the economy is it marks the beginning of really major changes in the cotton trade, but that will be a subject for another lecture. So that's my brief uh, sort of focused uh, partial lecture on the Civil War in New Orleans.